Let me open with a few words about the chair uh, itself, which honors the late Mr. Robertson, a 1942 graduate of the university and a 1948 graduate of the law school. Harrison was a leading practitioner and real estate investor in the city of Baltimore and a civic and philanthropic leader in Baltimore and uh, Palm Beach, Florida, as well as a dedicated and engaged alumnus of both the university and the law school. Upon his death in 2013, a bequest from his estate, together with gifts made during his lifetime, funded the Harrison Robertson Professorship. The inaugural Robertson professor, Kimberly Kessler Frizan, received her BA from the University of North Carolina and her JD from the University of Pennsylvania. Even as a law student, she had a strong interest in criminal law and after graduation and a clerkship, worked as a prosecutor in the public integrity section of the Justice Department's criminal division, handling criminal cases against public officials. She also served as a special assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. Kim began her teaching career at Rutgers Camden, where she won several teaching awards. She spent the 2012-2013 academic year as a visiting fellow at Princeton University and joined our faculty in 2014. Much of Kim's scholarship focuses on choice and blameworthiness. Her book with Larry Alexander and Steve Morse, Crime and Culpability, A Theory of Criminal Law, argues that moral blameworthiness is a necessary condition for criminal punishment and a reason, although not always a sufficient reason, to punish. In short, it takes what the authors call a moderate retributivist position. The book derives a theory of moral culpability that considers an actor's state of mind, assessments of risk, deliberation, and motivation. In a large body of work, Kim applies her theory of the mental determinants of culpability to specific issues within criminal law. One often consequential mental state on which Kim has written several times is intent. As we know, the consequences criminal law attaches to an act often turn on whether that act was intentional. We often assess intention by observing results and asking whether the accused was motivated to produce those results. But as Kim points out in her important article, Beyond Intention, equating intent with motivation may limit the, no the notion of intent in normatively puzzling ways. If motivated solely by hunger, I go hunting and kill and eat the first thing I come across, which I know happens to be on an endangered species list, does it make sense to say that I didn't intend to kill an endangered animal simply because I would have been happy to eat a non-endangered animal? Kim criticizes the link between motivation and intent, contending that we need a theory of intent that is grounded in the philosophy of mind. This, she argues, would focus on whether an actor understands empirically and conceptually that one act is linked to another. Intent is therefore, in her view, a broader concept than motivation. This has implications not only for the many cases in which criminal liability turns on intent, but also for the few cases, such as hate crimes, in which criminal liability turns explicitly on motivation. We cannot equate the two concepts in either case. Kim has also written extensively on mental states that involve taking dangerously excessive risks as they relate to legal concepts such as recklessness or depraved indifference to human life. Her focus here has been on choices made and how the actor understood his or her choices. Kim has turned several times to the topic of self-defense, which she analyzes from the standpoint of the consequences of culpability. In particular, she argues that culpable aggressors, and even those who culpably appear to be aggressors, forfeit rights and consequently that we can use force against them. Non-culpable aggressors, uh, culpable aggressors by contrast, do not forfeit rights even in the situation in which their actions may, by hypothesis innocently, cause another's death. This implies at a minimum that non-culpable aggressors do not commit a crime by fighting back nor do third parties commit a crime by coming to the aid of the innocent but lethal aggressor. All of Kim's work, whether on self-defense, intent, premeditation, 
recklessness or preventive detention, aims to build a philosophical foundation for the criminal law's treatment of the topic at hand. Often she concludes that issues that seem settled are actually more complicated than they appear. These analyses have established her as a leading figure in the philosophy of criminal law. Today, Kim will explore the connections among risk, mental states, and culpability, themes that have motivated several of her prior papers, and will tie those to questions of causation. Please join me in welcoming the Harrison Robertson Professor of Law, Kimberly Frizzell. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, as Dean Mahoney's momentous deanship uh, draws to a close, I have to confess that the sort of sentimental part of me wanted to be the last chair lecture of his deanship. Uh, dean Mahoney is the dean that brought me here, and his enthusiasm for my work and for having me be a part of this school was a large component in my decision to come to Virginia. And that was even before I heard his tremendous summary of my work. Uh, Last One of last year's chair recipients uh, decided to do her lecture this year. She is going after me, and so, of course, she gets to be last instead of me. Uh, but I do get to be first. I get to, I'm honored to be the inaugural Harrison Robertson Professor of Law. Uh, as you heard a bit from Dean Mahoney, uh, Harrison Marshall Robertson Jr. was a double who. Uh, he graduated from the University of Virginia in 1942. He then enlisted in the Army as a private. He was subsequently discharged as a captain with a Bronze Star for Valor and an Army Commendation Ribbon. He then went to UVA Law School, graduating in 1948. He was a su successful lawyer in both the public and private sector, served in many civic organizations, and was a member of the UVA Board of Managers, and in fact, the president of the UVA Alumni Association. In 1996, he created a trust for this chair, and it was bequeathed to the law school in December of 2013, uh, when he died at the age of 93. Even though I've been here for less than two years, I don't find it surprising that someone could be so attached to Virginia law and that it could have such a profound impact that that person would be willing to endow a chair nearly a half a century after he graduated. Uh, it's rare to find such engaged analytical minds in the bodies of warm, generous, friendly people. Uh, sadly, the people I'm referring to don't seem to have come to my lecture today, uh, but you know, all know who I'm talking about. In all seriousness, this is a very special place, and I'm honored to receive a chair named after people who love this school as much as I do. Uh, so as you've heard from Dean Mahoney, I write in criminal law. And in 2009, Larry Alexander and I wrote Crime and Culpability, A Theory of Criminal Law. This book was aim to be thoroughly retributivist. Mainly, we aim to think about how the criminal law should be structured if you punish people according to what they deserve. And among the things we argued, the first thing we said is negligence isn't culpable. All my crim students know I think this. And negligence should be, in fact, chucked out of the criminal law. We also argued that purpose and knowledge can actually, normatively at least, be collapsed into recklessness. So you would only need one mental state to capture culpability, and that would be recklessness. And the final thing that we argued, or among the final things we argued, is that attempts should be punished the same as completed crimes, that results don't matter at all. So the basic idea is this. Right? Say you want to get home to watch a basketball game, and to get home to watch that basketball game, you decide to speed 100 miles per hour through a school zone in the middle of the day. This strikes you as culpable, right? So why? Well, first we take the risks as you foresee them. So you're thinking, well, there's a risk that I might kill school children. There's a risk to other drivers and pedestrians. There's a risk to property. And it's those risks against your reasons for imposing that risk, namely to get to home to watch a basketball game. Then law or morality is the one that does the balancing, right? Do the reasons that you have justify the risks that you're imposing? Here, certainly not. You don't get to risk little children's lives to watch a basketball game, even a UVA basketball game. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes your reasons do justify imposing the risk, so you get to speed at least a little bit to take a friend to the hospital. So this formulation seemingly allowed us to reject causation. 
two fires combine at the same time to burn down the house? Who cares, right? Did you? The one else, I should get a standing ovation for that. Um, <laughs> Did you consciously disregard a substantial and unjustifiable risk that you would harm persons or property when you lit the match? Second question, bullet bounces off five surfaces before it enters the body. Was this mechanism foreseeable? Who cares, right? Did you, in fact, risk life for the bad reason of wanting someone dead? Causation, smallization. Now it's 2016, and Larry Alexander and I are writing another book, dealing with all the sort of puzzles that were left over after our first book. And this lecture is based on what I'm writing in chapter two, which you might entitle, Causation, Who Cares? Apparently, we have to. So the problem is that there have been what have traditionally be see been seen as causal inquiries are actually embedded within the culpability calculation itself. So let me give you two examples of this. The first question is whether, in assessing the risk the actor imposes, he must take into account the effect his action will have on another causally downstream actor. So say it's the morning, I'm deciding what do I want to wear today, and I think, do I want to wear this red shirt? And I know that my neighbor next door is very upset with her son because he wrecked her red car. And in fact, that wearing this red shirt might prompt her to remember this about her son, and then she's going to punch him. Do I actually have to take that punching into account as a risk that I am imposing when I decide what to wear that day? The second puzzle uh, that I'm going to focus on, at least today, is what to say when the actor knows that his action is overdetermined. So take the Dylan case in torts, right? Little kid is plummeting to his death, right? And he grabs the electric wires, right? So he dies from the electric wires instead of from going splat on the ground, right? But he was going to die anyway from going splat on the ground. Now modify it. You see somebody who is falling to his death, and you think, hey, they're dead anyway, and you shoot them, right? Have you, in fact, imposed any risk of harm, given that the person is going to die anyway? Or you see that A is about to kill B, and A has a box of bullets, and you say, hey, here, use my bullet instead. But for your intervention, B's dead anyway, so have you consciously disregarded a risk of death? Alas, it seems we haven't avoided causation after all. And I want to explore my answers to both of those puzzles uh, with you here today. Notably, keep in mind, I don't have to answer these puzzles as puzzles about what causation is. But I have to answer, and we have to have some sense of what causation is, to the extent that it factors into whether the actor understands himself to be imposing a risk. So causation gets into the culpability calculation because causation impacts culpability. So let's start with downstream, culpable, unjustified actors. And the question here under consideration is, to what extent must an actor take into account the fact that his action increases the risk of another person's downstream, culpable wrongdoing? So the most notable way the law typically answers this question is with proximate causation and the idea that voluntary human actors break causal chains. That would mean that downstream culpable actors absolve us of responsibility. What they do isn't part of our risk and therefore doesn't go into the risk we must justify. I don't need to worry that my neighbor's going to beat her kid because that beating isn't a risk I am imposing. So I think there are three problems with seeing voluntary human actors as breaking causal chains. First, in terms of what the criminal law ultimately holds us accountable for, descriptively, it's just not true that voluntary human actors always absolve us of responsibility. There are times we are fully on the hook for somebody else's culpable wrongdoing. And more on that in just a moment. Secondly, metaphysically, it's just not true. So can I ask the people who are wearing glasses to raise their hands for a moment? Okay, you can put them down. Thank you. Did you see that Dean Mahoney's hand went up? It did, right? Went up. I don't think he was stretching. I don't think he had some nervous twitch. I think I caused his hand to go up. Right? As I caused everybody who's wearing glasses to raise their hands. Right? Your arms went into the air because I gave you a reason for action. Right? So in fact, we do impact the world. We can change things in the world, even through somebody else's uh, 
choices. So it's simply not true that we don't cause things because voluntary human actors break chains. Third, normatively, it's just unattractive. If we actually cause other people's actions, we shouldn't be able to escape responsibility simply by hiding behind the voluntary actions of others. We're going to need a more robust account of why some other responsible actor's behavior can or should limit our responsibility. So let's return again to my descriptive claim that the criminal law does hold us accountable for others' culpable actions. Uh, and they don't do this by grappling with a very difficult question. They sort of duck in two different directions. Uh, one that I think actually is over-inclusive and the other approach is under-inclusive. So on the one hand, criminal law has doctrines like solicitation and accomplice liability. And for those doctrines, the criminal law requires purpose. It actually has to be your purpose to encourage or aid the crime. That means that there's no accomplice liability for the person who provides the address of a known drug dealer, uh, knowing the person's going to go off and buy drugs. No accomplice liability as to uh, the distribution of those drugs. And at least under the model penal codes formulation, there's no accomplice liability when a prison inmate hands another prisoner a knife that the prison inmate knows the other person is going to use to stab a prison guard, right? Because in those cases, it is not his purpose to cause the guard's death. He only knows that the guard will die. Now, certainly in the face of this second case, the Fountain case, uh, Judge Posner did decide that knowledge was sufficient because it seemed like a really serious harm. But the model penal code still stays wed to purpose. And we're still luck left with the question, why is it? Why does purpose sometimes matter? Why does knowledge sometimes matter? What's the grounding for this? And more importantly, we are sometimes on the hook for others' voluntary human actions. Now, the other way that we're on the hook for other people's actions is through criminalization itself. So let's say that I'm a well-trained gun owner. I live out in the woods. I don't have kids. Uh, and so I'm not going to harm anyone by having a gun. But in fact, the state is worried that somebody else might steal my gun and shoot someone with it. And so the state decides to limit my liberty in owning the gun because of the potential downstream wrongdoing of someone else in taking my gun and using it. Here, I'm not acting purposefully, knowingly, or even recklessly, and yet the state is coming in and saying, because of somebody else's potential wrongdoing, you can't do something. So at this point, we know that we have causal effects on other people, and we know the law sometimes holds us accountable for these effects. But we need to know why these effects should or should not count. Do we need to take on board the potential wrongdoing of others? So my answer today is, yes, most of the time we do. If what I do is right, how can you make it wrong? Because your potential wrongdoing means that what I'm doing isn't right in the first place. My action can become wrong because it increases the risk that you will do wrong. And thus, I can be culpable for deciding to take the action anyway. So let's consider a case call I'm going to call reckless facilitator. So Rick lawfully owns a gun. He usually leaves it lying around in his apartment. It doesn't pose a risk to anyone. Rick has a house guest, Sam. Sam is staying with Rick because Sam is in a fight with his girlfriend, Tara. They're in a fight because Sam abuses Tara and Sam has threatened to kill Tara. Rick then leaves his gun in plain view as he would if Sam were not present. So the question I want to ask, the recklessness question is, did Rick consciously disregard a substantial and unjustifiable risk of harm to Tara by leaving the gun out around Sam? And to know that, we need to know what kind of risk Rick is taking. And to know that, we need to know whether Sam's behavior is part of Rick's risk or whether instead Sam's behavior is his responsibility alone. Right? Now, notice these aren't cases where you're leaving a gun out around irresponsible kids or something like that. You know you can't leave a gun out around irresponsible agents. The question here is, when Sam's a fully responsible person, is in fact Sam's conduct or his potential conduct part of the risk that Rick has to take on board? 
right? That is the way that harms caused by downstream culpable actors work their way into the calculation is that they require us to ask how, when, and to what extent are the potential culpable and wrongful actions of another person a risk I impose. If we were to take the position that voluntary human actors truly break causal chains, then no harm that occurs after another's culpable intervention would count as rendering our conduct unjustifiable. In deciding whether the action is justified, these harms wouldn't be part of the calculus. The fact that you may later do wrong would not be my problem. Right, and keep in mind, for the kinds of cases I'm talking about, these are cases where the actor actually is aware of and foresees the risk. We're not talking about some random thing that happens and whether you're on the hook for it. We're asking whether when Rick actually foresees the fact that Sam could use the gun, whether in fact Rick must take that risk into account in deciding what to do. Now, some theorists think that another's action isn't on your ledger unless you make it your project. That's the idea behind purpose for accomplice liability. But this seems odd. Why do we think that you need to take into account that shouting uh, on a ski slope could cause an avalanche, but not that leaving a gun available could cause a death? If we're generally required to take into account the effects that our actions have on the world, why is that cabin just because the causal mechanism happens to be human? So let's return to Rick. When Rick uh, argues that he's justified in leaving the gun out, even though he knows it might be used to kill Tara, what can he say in support of his argument? The weakest point I think he has is he simply wants to, right? I want to leave my gun where I want to leave my gun. Admittedly, I think he does have a liberty interest here. The problem is, it's not a particularly strong one when compared to the risk of harm to Tara. It may also be true that Carla feels like yelling on a ski slope, but you're not allowed to do that if it's going to cause an avalanche. And Doug may want to drive his car very fast, but he's not allowed to do that if Ed is in the car in front of him. And so another person's uh, action is just part of our causal universe and hence is part of the downstream concerns that an actor has to take into account and that can limit his conduct. Rick simply has little justification for increasing the risk of death to Tara. Now, I think there are two potential reasons the law departs from this view. First, as Sandy Kadish rightly observed, the law is concerned with preserving the idea of free will. So the way Kadish was asking this question is, why do we even need a doctrine of complicity, right, or accomplice liability? If A, the accomplice, gives P, the perpetrator, a gun, and the perpetrator uses it to kill the victim, why not say accomplice killed victim? Right? Why even have this weird complicity doctrine? I think that it's derivative through the principle. Why do we do this? And Kadish's answer was that the criminal law is concerned with free will. We're concerned about the idea that you can act causally through someone else. Because the worry here would be that then the principle, by somehow being caused, doesn't have responsibility. Right. We have to be these free will uncaused causers. So if Rick causes Sam to do something, we would somehow undermine Sam's responsibility. However, as many a compatibilist has urged, you can think that you can hold people responsible even if they're caused. Right? Everybody with eyeglasses in this room who raised his or her hand was caused, and yet at the same time, they're responsible and deserve my thanks for having raised their hands anyway. So my goal isn't to solve the free will determinism debate uh, here today, but to say I think we can appeal to notions of causation without giving away notions of responsibility. Moreover, if we really have a problem with free will, criminal law has much bigger problems than this, right? We're going to have to give up a whole bunch of things about holding people responsible if it turns out we're caused, uh, and yet when we're caused, we can't be responsible. Moreover, to the extent that we think that we're respecting somebody or that autonomy requires uh, sort of treating them as uncaused, I don't think we have to treat people as utterly unpredictable wild cards. Do we really think this is true? I mean, admittedly, I was pretty darn certain that people were going to raise their hands when I asked them to with glasses. I was sure Dean Mahoney was going to do that. I know that my husband is going to be watching one of three television channels anytime I walk into the room. Um, I know if... 
<laughs> I promised you I'd mention it. Um, <laughs> I know that if my son has a free minute, he will. I would be willing to bet my life he will ask to play video games. He actually had a special request to be in here, right? So. Uh, is it disrespectful or autonomy undermining that I dared to write down that I knew people with eyeglasses would raise their hands or for me to turn the channel to the channel I know my husband is likely to watch or for me to anticipate and say no right before my child asks to play video games, right? I think that we often make sense of human action and we often predict what people will do without somehow disrespecting them. Right? In fact, how would life work if you couldn't predict what people would do? That people wouldn't, would keep their promises or stop at red lights, right? These things are things we rely on and it doesn't undermine autonomy to think that human beings are predictable. Moreover, I'm also not suggesting that we need to anticipate the unpredictable. I'm merely suggesting that when we do predict uh, someone's actions, that those are things we have to take into account. So if the law's metaphysical concern is unfounded, what's the other reason why the law is so reluctant to hold us accountable for another's acts? One worry seems to be that putting others' potential wrongdoing on your ledger is that it seems that another person can restrict your liberty by his potential wrongdoing. Do we have slightly stronger claims not to have our liberty limited by the intervening wrongdoing of others? Right, so here's how I think we should think about this. There are some people who think voluntary, voluntary actors always break chains. There are people who think they never break chains. Then there are the people who think when it's mediated that there's sort of a discount. So I don't understand the idea behind a discount, you know, kill five people, get five people free. It doesn't, I don't understand the sort of discount principle. But I think that what's underlying that intuition about a discount is the idea that when this risk is being imposed by somebody else's potential wrongdoing, you actually get to put an additional weight on your side, that there's actually a harm to your liberty that supports the justifiability of your conduct. So let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, assume A and B both go camping, and they're both supposed to sort of stomp out their fires, and I've learned from my nephews that really what you're supposed to do is pour tons and tons and tons of water so the wood can never, ever, ever reignite. But in my world, for purposes of this hypo, it is just a to leave a, a campsite with a campfire that only has a 5% chance of, that has less than a 5% chance of rekindling. So if it's 5% or more, you got to do more work. But if it's less than 5%, feel free to move on. So now let's assume you've got A and B. And A says, well, I've done a really good job here. But I foresee that the culpable C who's out there you know, the bad guy who always has the gasoline to reignite forest, uh, reignite fires, there's a 5% chance that he's in fact going to reignite this fire, right? And then it looks like leaving the fire at that point is unjustifiable if that 5% is on A's ledger. B, on the other hand, has left the same 5% chance, but the 5% chance there is just an ordinary average breeze will reignite. Now, it looks as though A and B are doing the same thing, 5% chance of reignition. But I think what A would say to us is this is very different. If you take C out of the picture, there's a very, very, very small chance that what I have left will reignite into a fire. And what that means is that what C is doing in roaming around and pouring gas on fires is imposing a cost on me that I have to do more work. Right? I have to do work because I foresee someone else's action. So A would be fully justified if he could exempt C's possible wrongdoing. So C's able to impose this cost on A, cost A would not otherwise be required to bear absent a chance of wind. So I claim uh, that A has a reason that supports the justifiability of his conduct that B doesn't. A's liberty interest here isn't just the liberty interest of wanting to be able to roam around and do whatever he wants. A has an interest in not having other people impose obligations on him, make him have to do more because of their culpable, culpable wrongdoing. So it's true that they are both faced with the same causal universe with the same probabilities, but we are reluctant to think that the other otherwise permissible actions or in otherwise permissible actors should yield their liberty because of others' culpable wrongdoing. Yet that is precisely what is at stake when we allow others to impose burdens on us by their culpable choices. 
In most cases, I think even this additional weight on your side of the ledger, just like your side of the ledger of wanting to see the Knicks game, isn't going to be sufficient to overcome the harm to others. That Sam imposes a burden on Rick is not enough to outweigh the risk of harm to Tara. But when these burdens are more substantial, they can justify acting uh, despite the downstream risks that others pose. Now, look, we don't have a lot of sympathy for Rick. We don't feel badly that he can't leave his gun lying around in the presence of abusive, misogynistic, violent house guests, right? But this case also poses a problem for merchants selling lawful goods, right? So gun shops sell guns. Kitchen supply stores sell knives. Liquor stores sell liquor. Uh, and so the question is, what should we say about the person who sells a gun uh, that might be used in a robbery, sells a knife that might be used in a stabbing, sells a case of champagne that might be used for a high school graduation party? The merchant might believe that there's a small risk that the harm will occur. May he simply sell the item? So in earlier work, uh, Larry Alexander and I wrote a separate paper where we argued for recklessness, we love recklessness, and argued for a shopkeeper's exemption. And recently, Michael Moore and Heidi Hurd also decided to adopt recklessness and thought that a shopkeeper's privilege uh, was the way to go in these situations. They unpacked this as four separate requirements, and I think that those separate requirements of when the shopkeeper's privilege would apply are instructive to exactly this kind of balance that I'm talking about here. So the first thing they said is shopkeepers only have a privilege to sell something, right, that they see could potentially cause harm when in fact it's human action and not intervening non-human forces, right? That's because only human actors put something on our side of the ledger. They said that the crime facilitated and the degree of facilitation have to be insubstantial. Well, that makes sense because when we're balancing risks versus Versus reasons, the greater the risk you're imposing, the better your reasons have to be. They said the sale has to be part of a larger routine. That again makes sense because we're talking about somebody's autonomy interest. So the interest in going out of your way to double check things about where, where your champagne's being used is quite different than the interest you would have or how your limer, liberty would be limited because somebody has asked you to special order a cleaver that cuts through bone, right? In that case, so we liber, limit your liberty somewhat. And there have to be strong agent relative reasons of autonomy that support the act of aiding. Again, this weight on your side that, in fact, by worrying about other people's wrongdoing, does this, in fact, impose a burden on you? So in the average case, shopkeepers simply aren't going to be aware of and consciously disregarding any significant risk that their products are going to be used for illegal means. Nevertheless, in an idealized criminal law, when shopkeepers are aware of these risks, we would attend directly to the liberty interests that are at stake. Anytime we ask whether someone has consciously disregarded a substantial and unjustifiable risk, we need to know when the downstream action of another person counts as a risk we need to justify. And ultimately, Alexander and I are stuck with giving an answer to whether voluntary human actors break causal chains, even if causing harm itself is irrelevant to blameworthiness. And my claim today is that there's just no chain breaking to be had. Uh, of course, this is only the first cut at the puzzle. Once we start balancing these harms against the causal influence, we've got to think more about what else could be on the actor's side of the ledger, what else counts as a liberty interest. One place this might be quite important is the idea of free speech. I won't pretend when you get to those questions that there are easy answers here. And I don't think there should be easy answers here. When you are engaging in an action that has the potential to make the world worse, even through the actions of another person, that's a consideration you have to take into account. Just as it may be the right thing to do to speed to get your friend to the hospital, but you should absolutely take into account the fact that you're risking harm to other people and their property. So that's just one of many puzzles in chapter two. And I just want to discuss one more with you in the few minutes that remain, because I promised you all some discussion of Dylan, the boy who uh, was going to land and splat when he was instead electrocuted. Right? And I may have said, who cares when two fires combine? Uh, but I didn't say I didn't think the puzzle was fun. And unfortunately, I have to care about this puzzle because, in fact, it impacts culpability. Okay, so recall again that Dylan is the case where the boy is plummeting to his death. 
Uh, and he grabs the electric wires and he's instead uh, killed by those. And we're going to substitute instead that Harry is plummeting to his death and Greta sees this and she thinks, well, Harry's as good as dead. And if, if you think Harry might live, imagine spikes coming out of the ground. Whatever you need to, to make sure you're clear, Harry's going to die when he hits the ground on impact. But Greta says, okay, he's as good as dead. I'm going to shoot him. Or imagine that Ingrid has always wanted to kill Jake and sees Ken, a skilled sniper, pointing a rifle at him. And he's got a huge box of bullets. And Ingrid says, here, use mine. Right? Not all of these puzzles even have to involve culpable, evil, vicious people. You can imagine, uh, as Otto Hock uh, did in a paper, that a terrorist says to driver, take me to the school or I will kill you. And we can similarly ask whether the driver is blameworthy for taking the terrorist to the school when he knows that if he doesn't take the terrorist, terrorist can simply call Uber. So under the earlier formulation in crime and culpability, it seems that Greta, Ingrid, and Driver can plausibly claim that they didn't understand themselves to be increasing the risk of harm. That is, we said you have to consciously disregard a substantial non-justifiable risk here of death. But if the death's going to happen anyway, then the amount that Greta, Ingrid, and Driver are increasing the harm is zero. The objective probability doesn't change by their actions. That would mean that Ingrid should feel free to volunteer her bullet and Greta can justifiably take the shot. Yet it's still true that Harry will die by Greta's action, that Jake will now die by Ingrid's bullet, and that the terrorist, terrorist will get to the location because Driver took him there. So as a first cut in thinking about these preemptive overdetermination cases. And what that means is you have two things. The result's going to happen anyway, right? That's what makes it overdetermined. Two fires combined, but for fire one, fire two burns it down, but for fire two, fire one burns it down. It means we've got a problem with but four, that it's not really capturing causation. And preemption cases are where one cause gets there before the other one does. So fire one burns down the house before fire two gets there, but fire two would have burned down the house. Or Harry dies from the bullet, but he would have otherwise died from the floor. In these cases, we simply should say that the causation question isn't accurately answered by the counterfactual but for test, right? I mean, if Greta shoots Harry, Greta kills Harry, right? It does not matter that he was going to die anyway. The cause of death will be the bullet coming from Greta. So accordingly, I actually think we need to refine the test we set forth in crime and culpability. And instead of saying that the actor has to consciously disregard a risk of harm, it has to be that one is culpable when one understands one's actions to increase the risk that he will cause harm. After all, the reason why Greta is shooting is because she wants to kill Harry. If she wanted to shoot a dead body, she could wait till he landed on the ground. So interestingly, though, it does appear that it's the defendant's notion of causation that matters here. It's whether they understand themselves to be causing something in the world. So consider a variation of murder on the Orient Express. You've got 10 people who stab the victim independently. And it turns out nine stab wounds would have been enough. All my crim students who went through this last year are nodding now. Hooray, they still remember. Um, what if you're number 10? And the victim accurately assesses that the nine wounds are going to be sufficient. Does he consciously disregard a substantial and unjustifiable risk? This actually turns on whether he thinks he's causing anything. It turns out that if this 10th person is Justice Scalia, then in fact there's no liability because there's no culpability. That's because Justice Scalia says the following thing about in Burge versus the United States. So let me read this. Uh, this but-for requirement is part of the common understanding of cause. Consider a baseball game in which the visiting team's leadoff batter hits a home run in the top of the first inning. If the visiting team goes on to win by a score of 1-0, to zero, every person competent in the English language and familiar with the American pastime would agree that the victory resulted from the home run. This is so because it is natural to say that one event is the outcome or consequence of another when the former would not have occurred but for the latter. It is beside the point that the victory also resulted from a host of other necessary causes, such as skillful pitching, the coach's decision to put the leadoff batter in the lineup, and the league's decision to schedule the game. 
By contrast, it makes little sense to say that an event resulted from one or was the outcome of some earlier action if the action merely played a non-essential contributing role in producing the event. Now, I would have thought that is causation, but Justice Scalia does not. If the visiting team wound up winning five to two rather than one to zero, one would be surprised to read in the sports page that the victory resulted from the leadoff batter's early non-dispositive home run. Okay, well, the first thing I've learned from this is I'm really glad that Justice Scalia is not coaching my kids' little league team. Hey, kids, great job. But since you won five to two, none of you were necessary or sufficient for the win. None of you caused it. None of you are responsible. None of you get a pat on the back, and none of you get an ice cream cone. Okay. So, but I think that the more central question here is what this last batter thinks or what the last stabber in the mur murder on the Orient Express case thinks. If they truly think they don't causally contribute at all, right, not just that the harm is overdetermined, but that they play absolutely positively no result, role in producing the result, then it seems they don't think they've unleashed a risk. That is, there's no reason to teach this, treat this question of causation any differently than when we do when we let the defendant's conception of causation matter in other ways. Stab a voodoo doll, think you're going to kill somebody? You count as purposefully trying to kill them. Shoot a stuffed deer, think it's a real one? You uh, get treated as purposefully trying to shoot a real deer. So as the defendant understands her actions, that's what determines culpability. And it's her understanding of the causal efficacy of her actions that determines whether she's conscious disregarding a risk. So if the defendant truly thinks that her action is causally irrelevant, then there is no risk. Now, in most cases, this doesn't strike me as likely. After all, the reason Greta shoots Harry is she wants to be the one to kill him. Similarly, Ingrid provides the bullet because she wants to, be, to kill Jake. And if you stab somebody who's already got nine stab wounds, you still want to be part of the cause of some of the loss of blood. That's the entire point. So it is, in fact, the case that most of the time you will be on the hook because you do understand yourself to be playing a causal role. But I've got one more wrinkle I've got to figure out here, because even if this solves the causing harm problem, the question is whether it solves the causing harm problem. What do I mean by this? So even if Greta causes Harry's death, the next question is whether Greta harmed Harry. Right, so in tort law, you've got to figure out how much damages somebody gets and how much damages they get depends on how much harm there is. So if Greta is a first semester law student who's just read Dylan, she's actually going to think that she's causing minimal harm. Why is that? Because the court says, in such an outcome of his loss of balance, Dylan falling, the defendant deprived him not of a life of normal expectancy, but of one too short to be given pecuniary allowance. In the alternative, of not of a normal, but of a limited earning capacity in the other. If it were found that he would have thus fallen with death probably resulting, the defendant would not be liable unless for conscious suffering found to have sustained from the shock. In that situation, his life or earning capacity had no value. To constitute actionable negligence, there must be damage, and damage is limited to those elements the statute prescribes. The court then says if he was going to actually have survived, but with quite limited capacities, there's only damage to the difference between the death and those limited capa uh, uh, capacities. His probable future, but for the current, thus bears on liability as well as damages. So then you'd have the question that even though Greta clearly kills Harry, how much has she harmed him, at least on her conception of what he's doing, right? He's as good as dead Harry. I disagree with Greta. I think criminal law doesn't have to follow tort law's approach to valuing people. As Larry Alexander and I have actually maintained elsewhere, individuals' lives should count as legally and morally protected interests until the moment they actually die. Uh, here, the actors do understand themselves as ending someone's life. We generally understand when you terminate life support of a terminally ill person that you are, in fact, killing or letting them die, right? These people aren't free squares. You get to kill on whim because there's no real harm. Now, I'm not giving a robust account of harming here. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the terminally ill count for less, the elderly count for less. In Joel Feinberg's case, where you would have 
died in a plane crash, you know, you count for less, uh, and then, and we want to count these people for less than those with their days ahead of them. Uh, I disagree with that, but it could be true. But I take it that our best theory of harming would just simply be imported into the criminal law. But it's ultimately not Greta's call how much of a harm it is. It's instead a legal and moral question uh, that determines how harmful it is to prematurely end someone's life. So criminal law protects all lives equally, and the defendant's conception of the value of the, def of the victim's life is morally irrelevant. Right. Imagine that instead a defendant said, I believe in an afterlife. So yes, I killed the victim, but he went to a better place, right? I didn't harm him at all. Surely we'd reject this on grounds that so long as the defendant understood she was killing the victim, it doesn't matter that she doesn't conceptualize it as a harm. So where are we? In these sort of cases, these preemptive over-determination cases, I think that this person, this first actor, the Greta in the case, is still the cause, and in fact, she understands herself to be such. Moreover, even if she thinks her victim is as good as dead, neither law nor morality has given individuals a free pass to kill the almost dead. So Greta is culpable for unleashing a risk that she understands will kill Harry, and she doesn't get to decide that Harry doesn't count. Of course, my project doesn't end there. There's all kinds of additional fun, polluting, voting, downstream actors who are idiosyncratic and unduly reliant, moral blackmailers, uh, and all other kinds of situations that impact the world and impose risks. And we then need to decide whether those risks render our actions unjustifiable and our choices culpable. Interestingly, because criminal law has been so concerned with causation as its own element, we had yet to see how these causal questions arise even with respect to the defendant's state of mind. Having thumbed my nose at causal contortions, it seems that understanding culpability itself requires that I address those questions head on. Thank you.